It's great to be here. I sorry I have to cut, sort of run in and run out, um, but um, I just wanted to uh, come and uh, support what you're doing. Um, I don't have a lot to say about Manning. I don't know that much about his case um, or him as an individual. But what I do know is that um, it matters the perception of a flawed criminal justice system, right? When when our um, system, the the safeguards that we put into place aren't observed, the whole. It, it undermines the legitimacy of the system itself. And it affects not only this one particular case, but it affects our entire criminal justice system. So a lot of the work that I've been doing uh, with the Innocence Project, the Illinois Innocence Project, which is housed at University of Illinois Springfield, I'm new to the project. I've only been there since the start of the year. They've been working for, I think, about 15 years um, on this project. Um, and their projects, as you know, all around the country. Um, but a lot, there's a lot of similarities. So I wanted to come and encourage you not only to work um, on behalf of Manning, but also to um, think about working um, on behalf of the entire system. Um, and you can do that through the criminal or through the uh, Innocence Project or in other ways. Um, but some of the similarities that are going on is that. Um, through the Innocence Projects, we found that there are all kinds of causes um, for wrongful conviction, but they've identified a few main causes, um, and some of these seem really applicable to Manning's case. So they include eyewitness misidentification, unvalidated or improper forensic science, um, it, uh, bad lawyering, but then also false confessions and admissions, government misconduct, and informants and snitches. And these seem to have some, some resonance. Um, so I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about, about uh, these causes and then what some of the things that we're trying to do or encourage people to do um, in order to try to rectify this. Um, the first one that seems most applicable, right, is government misconduct. Um, and, of course, we know that this isn't universal, it's not widespread. We have a lot of law enforcement officers and prosecutors that are honest and trustworthy. But criminal justice is a human endeavor, and um, the possibility for negligence, misconduct, and corruption exists. Even if only one officer of every thousand is dishonest, then wrongful convictions are going to continue to occur. Um, and what we know through the Innocence Project is that we've had people exonerated based on DNA evidence. They've been proven to be innocent, and yet they had been convicted by the system. So um, it means that there are problems within the system that we can hopefully try to fix. Um, some of the common forms of misconduct by law enforcement officers include employing suggestions while conducting identification procedures coercing false confessions, lying or intentionally misleading jurors about their observations, failing to turn over exculpatory evidence to prosecutors, providing incentives to secure unreliable evidence from informants. Um, common forms of misconduct by prosecutors include withholding exculpatory evidence from the defense, deliberately mishandling, mistreating or destroying evidence, allowing witnesses they know or should know um, that are not truthful to testify, and pressuring defense witnesses to testify. Even relying on fraudulent forensic evidence, evidence they know isn't trustworthy, and making misleading arguments that overstate the value of, of certain testimony. So all of these factors are going on within the system. We need to have some way to address them. But before I get to that, I'll talk to you a little bit about false confessions. And even though Manning hasn't made a confession, or at least we don't know that, the, the, the danger is out there because of the way that he's being treated. A lot of factors um, that they've identified um, that can contribute to false in, uh, confessions usually happen during police interrogations. And they include things like duress, coercion, it, um, diminished capacity, mental impairment, ignorance of the law, fear of violence, the actual infliction of harm, 
the threat of a harsh sentence, misunderstanding of the situation, and interminable uh, periods of interrogation, right? Um, uh, confessions obtained from juveniles are usually less reliable. Children are so easy to manipulate, they're not always fully aware of their situation. Children and adults both are often um, convinced that they can go home as soon as they admit guilt. So they aren't guilty, they didn't do it, um, they don't believe that they did it, but they're, they're told if you just admit it, you can leave. Um, uh, people with mental disabilities have often um, falsely confessed because they are tempted to accommodate and agree with authority figures. Um, many law, law enforcement interrogators are not given any sort of special training on how to question suspects with mental disabilities. Um, an impaired mental state due to mental illness, drugs, or alcohol may also elicit all kinds of admissions of guilt. Um, Mentally capable adults also give false confessions due to a variety of factors like the length of interrogation, exhaustion, or a belief that they can be released after confessing and proving their innocence um, later. So regardless of age, regardless of capacity or the state of the confessor, what they often have in common is a decision at some point during the interrogation process that confessing will be more beneficial to them than continuing to maintain their innocence. Um, sometimes law enforcement officers use harsh interrogation tactics with uncooperative suspects and some uh, police officers are convinced of a suspect's guilt um, if they are convinced of a suspect's guilt, they'll use tactics so persuasive that an innocent person feels compelled to confess. Some suspects, of course, have confessed to avoid physical harm or discomfort. Others are told they'll be convicted with or without a confection, excuse me, confession, but their sentence will be more lenient if they confess. And some are told a confession is the only way to avoid a death penalty. Um, so there's all kinds of um, uh, ways that policies that the Innocence Projects are advocating uh, to change some of these uh, really terrible systematic problems within the criminal justice system that cause people who are innocent to confess, cause people who are innocent to be wrongfully convicted. Um, not the least of which is to have uh, all interrogations recorded. Right? If you require every time a police officer talks to a suspect to have that recorded, some of these problems can be avoided. Some states have those provisions, but there's all kinds of loopholes. The loopholes include if they have the equipment available. So how easy is that not to have the equipment available? It, or if you have it, to not have it be working, right? So we need to... Uh, have people go out and advocate for reforms that are going to be meaningful, have provisions that require police departments to have recording uh, uh, equipment that's operating and that they have to use that every time that they do an interrogation. And if they don't have the recording equipment available, then they don't get to interrogate the subject, right? They don't get to go ahead without it. Um, uh, We've tried to, around the country, bring people together, form commissions to start to work at making some of these policy changes. Um, North Carolina has an actual innocence commission created by the Chief Justice uh, that in North Carolina in 2002. Um, that commission has focused on causes of wrongful conviction and is considered really a national model for effectiveness and reform. Pennsylvania is another state where nine men have been proven innocent by DNA testing in recent years, and so the state uh, Senate created an innocence uh, commission in 2006. California, Connecticut, Wisconsin have also created commissions to study the causes of wrongful conviction. Um, in Illinois, the legislature passed um, into law 85 recommendations made by a special commission uh, created here to study capital punishment and create safeguards against wrongful convictions. We know what happened with the uh, capital punishment, but the problem is, is that the wrongful conviction um, uh, findings that they've had, the different systems that they can put into place, haven't been put into law. There are some 
uh, preliminary provisions, but we need people to advocate to make these a reality. We have the commission, we have the information, we know what we need to do, we need to get support to get people to, to, um, to get the legislature to put those into place. Um, so I would encourage you um, to take your energy for Manning and the problems that are going on uh, with um, the way that he's being treated, the way that the justice system at the federal level is operating, and say we also need to look at what's happening in our own state at the state level, try to prevent some of these um, innocent people from uh, being convicted. I mean, you can only imagine, right? We can only imagine the horror. You didn't do it, you're convicted, and you go to prison. And we have had and continue to have exonerations in the state um, showing that our system is just as flawed as all the others. So thanks for listening. Um, I'm uh, at uh, University of Illinois Springfield. Um, the Innocence Project is always looking for volunteers, uh, people to get involved at any level. So if you have interest, um, you can find me um, at the university or the project itself is there. Um, and good luck. Thanks. <laughs>